Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series. Sit back, get comfortable, and let's go see what they have for us today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another of the Wednesday morning lecture programs here at Hess Park. We're happy to have you here, and uh, we've got an interesting program for you this morning about submarines put on by a very, very close friend of mine with whom I had the pleasure of working uh, in the energy industry. Our speaker this morning is Jim Jones, originally from Oak Park, Illinois, and he served as a Naval Reserve officer from the late 50s to the middle 60s in an engineering function at Mare Island Naval Shipyard and uh, at Yokosuka in Japan. The presentation this morning is titled The First Five. We'll cover the period from the launch of the Sputnik in 1957 through the area of Eisenhower, Khrushchev, and Rickover. And so let's talk about submarines, nuclear, and conventional powered subs. And please join me in welcoming Mr. Jim Jones. Thank you very much for that introduction, and good morning to you all. The subject that I'm going to talk about, I hope, makes all of us feel better and not worse. The title of the talk is The First Five, The Birth of the Submarine Nuclear Deterrent. The key word there is deterrent, and, and that is what moti motivated me then, and I hope to convey that sense of safety to you now. To begin with, let's look at where we were in the USA in the 1950s. The 50s are recalled as sort of a boring decade by people who had so much excitement after that. I'm not so sure that I recall it that way. Um, uh, Truman gave way to Eisenhower in 52. Uh, the folk era came in in 1954. Rock and roll came in in 1954, and music has never been the same. <laughs> the, uh, the Russians had the bomb, and an era of fear was present. In our fear, we were building fallout shelters. And uh, here's an instruction manual on a rather elegant fallout shelter. Let me ask, how many of you built fallout shelters? Well, neither did I, and I don't see a single hand raised. Uh, uh, I, I think we realized that, that it might not have helped. Uh, if, if the worst had happened. What was Mr. Khrushchev saying at the time? Anyone? We will bury you, exactly. You remember as, as I do, his pounding with his shoe on the podium. That didn't help the situation any of, of fear motivation in our country. In June of 1958, after the launch of Sputnik in the previous October, that little glistening ball that we all tried to see go overhead. Do you remember doing that? Uh, Eisenhower announced that our satellite would be put into orbit. In October, the Russians had beat us to it, and then again in November, they put the dog Laika into space. The first, the first dog, the first being to go into deep space. So a statement was needed by the president to pacify and mollify us and to get back that feeling of confidence that we could face any challenge. We needed to deter aggression. I'm going to turn that off a moment and, and just talk to you and tell you where I was at that time so you can see things through my eyes. Um, Oak Park, Illinois is uh, suburban Chicago. It, it borders on the city of Chicago. And I, I had driven down for several years down to Purdue in West Lafayette, Indiana, taking a course in mechanical engineering. I was a senior in that fall when Sputnik was launched. And I can remember a, a, a group of college seniors who, uh, with no longer having a, 
college is a party atmosphere attitude, and in fact, engineers probably never had that attitude in the first place. But I, I can well remember standing outside the chemical engineering building right on the corner uh, opposite uh, Hovde Hall, the Hall of, of Administration, in small groups thinking this is a challenge that we have to face. We really have to get serious about being engineers that this country needs. And I, I remember that as though it were just yesterday. Fortunately, the leaders in government and the service industries were not cowering in fear. <clears throat> Several developments were coming together to form a remarkable concept. And that concept was to be a worldwide deterrent to all aggression and to develop that deterrent rapidly. Now, 54 years later, that concept is still at work against today's aggression in all forms. Two particular innovations were elemental to that concept, but seem so far off that even setting out on the course was daunting. And of course, the first of those was tied in with the success of the nuclear-powered submarine Nautilus. It had been at sea since 1955, and it had traversed global waters uh, on seeming unending power, even spending a week to cruise beneath the polar ice cap at the North Pole. Its ability to reach unseen into 70% uh, Seventy percent of the Earth's surface was undeniable. A submarine's nuclear propulsion plant is not so mystifying. It's really very basic. You know, when you boil water, it turns into steam and expands. We all know that. When you run that expanded steam through uh, at high pressure through pipes and across the blades, rotating blades of a turbine, it makes that turbine turn. And any one of a number of things can be done with that turning turbine, powerful turning turbine, including uh, generating electrical power, or in this case, generating forward propulsion of a shaft. The red on the lower left is a closed loop of water. The nuclear reactor at the lower left heats that water, it becomes steam and goes up into the oval-shaped steam generator in the left-hand block, and that steam then passes across the top and down into the main turbine. It uh, is expended in that turbine, uh, turns back into low-pressure steam, is condensed back into water, and fed back into the blue portion of the boiler in an endless loop. So it's a very simple system, and in fact, we had to use 1928 low-pressure Ingersoll Rand turbines to produce that power with low enough uh, steam pressure that it would be usable in a nuclear submarine. There was an auxiliary electrical plant and battery charging that could be used to propel the submarine at slow speed. The plant for the Nautilus was the so-called S5W power plant. It was bigger than the S3W, which had been tested in Arco, Idaho by the Navy, um, under full power, a shore-based uh, power plant. The one who was in charge of that was Commander Edwin E. Kintner. And when he came to Mare Island at about the same time I did, he was one of the first people I met because uh, my then wife and I went out to buy a Christmas tree or a Christmas bush about that tall. And the guy we bought it from on the Boy Scout tree lot was Commander Ed Kintner, the head of the nuclear power school. He eventually played on my brass hat softball team and we got to know each other quite well. He was a splendid human being and, and totally devoted to the task. He was a Rickover man. There's no question about that. The other innovation that was required was a safe missile that could be launched from below the ocean. Whew! 
there wasn't such a thing at the time. Most missiles were uh, uh, liquid fueled and you couldn't put liquid fuel into a submarine. It was t terribly corrosive, terribly explosive. It had to be a solid propellant, so we're looking for a solid propellant uh, missile that could deliver three 20 kiloton warheads anywhere that the missile could fly. And that was the challenge. Now, while you rest your eyes for a moment, Let's focus on how significant this was in those years and then consider how necessary this deterrent is today. Uh, Jim Sweeney, uh, when he asked what the talk was about, I said, I'm going to sell you insurance. And everybody said, no, I consider this the ultimate life insurance. <laughs> I hope you buy that concept at least. So uh, I was not the only one to consider it important. Here's a letter. It's dated July 20th, 1960. Cape Canaveral, Florida, signed by J.B. Osborne, Commander U.S. Navy, Commanding Officer USS George Washington, SSBN 598. I'll refer to this a few times because it's very meaty. A milestone in naval history was marked today when the USS George Washington fired a Polaris missile from a submerged position off Cape Canaveral. It's a military axiom that every off to, to every offense there is a defense. Cannons were not the ultimate weapon because other cannons could easily destroy them. Bombers could be shot down. Hard missile bases can be knocked out by other missiles. By this rule, the Polaris submarine is as close to an ultimate weapon as we are likely to see for a long time to come. Its base is the environs of the ocean, more than 70% of the Earth's surface, which it can roam at will, always prepared to answer aggression with devastation. So what was the program? It was to bring together all the technology, the techniques, the material, the support levels, the bases, the political will, the funding, and the public acceptance to create this deterrent fleet of missile-firing nuclear submarines and to do it fast. Eisenhower ordered three boats, as submarines are called, to be built. And later, on New Year's Eve in 1957, after the first two Russian satellites were in space, and none of ours, he uh, ordered those three to be built, and later two more, the first five. The program, the program looked as though it would take eight years on any reasonable basis. The George Washington was deployed in three years and 10 months. Eisenhower said at the dedication of the George Washington, it is my prayerful hope that this ship will always be ready, but never used. Heroes emerged. Here are two. Admiral Red Rayburn on the left and Chief of Naval Operations Arley 31 Knot Burke, who had three terms as the Chief of Naval Operations were a winning leadership pair. Rear Admiral Rayburn made, uh, was made head of the Special Projects Office of the Bureau of Ships, and he worked with the CNO, uh, Chief of Naval Operations, Arlie Burke, to inspire every doubter, to demolish every barrier and convince every congressman. That was probably the hardest part. I worked under them both as a Bureau of Ships Engineering Duty Officer for over two years as a ship construction superintendent on the third of the uh, boomer boats, as they came to be called, very properly. And all in all, there were 41, and they were called the 41 for Freedom. 
Of course, there were many heroes at all levels, but I personally saw and heard Red Rayburn speaking to about 5,000 of the 11,000 civilian civil service employees that we had at Mare Island, not all working on this ship, but about 5,000 were working on, on uh, it, it's hard to call it a boat when it's such a strategic ship, <laughs> so I go back and forth, working on the, the TR, the Theodore Roosevelt, and standing up on a big bollard that you put, you, you wrap mooring lines around him, standing up on top of that bollard and giving them a Canute Rockney talk, giving us a, a Canute Rockney talk to inspire us. He was, he was something. Here's what the program produced. There were eventually five generations, and the diagonal stripes at the bottom there show five generations of missiles which were carried in different classes of submarines. The submarines could assure destruction of any aggressor, and today they're also able to engage in local area tactical conflicts as well. Comparing this to a World War II submarine, if you think back to the, to the films, the, the flickers in black and white, um, there's a single propeller. On the more modern submarines, the rudder uh, configuration uh, is entirely built around not only driving the submarine in the right direction, but also uh, keeping it very quiet, keeping that propeller very quiet. Um, one of the things that an American spy did and sold to the Japanese was the secret of how we made those anti-cavitating quiet propellers. And isn't it interesting that it was the Japanese that he sold it to? different story. The conning tower, where uh, notables such as John Wayne and other heroes uh, used to stand and be the last one down the hatch and the water would flood over it, has been replaced by a sail area, uh, whose, uh, although it certainly can be uh, manned, staffed, um, and, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that personally later. Um, the the uh, purpose of it is to support the, the masts, both periscopes and the antennas. So that's, and, and also obviously to keep the submarine on a level course. Now out each side there are sail planes. They used to be up on the bow. There's no room on the bow and it's not necessary for them to be there. They are uh, able to be individually articulated, and in fact, when the submarine is going through the water at a high angle, it swoops just like an airplane does with those sail planes. It's, it's very graceful and, of course, slow at the speed of a, of a ship through the water, but it's a, it's a very elegant feel. The first five were the George Washington at Electric Boat Division in Groton, Connecticut, the Patrick Henry, there also. The TR, the Theodore Roosevelt 600 at Mare Island up in Vallejo, Northern California. The 601, the Robert E. Lee at Newport News in Virginia. And the Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. Traditionally, submarines had been named for denizens of the deep. Fish and denizens of the deep, when I was a midshipman and learned that. It was proper that these strategic weapons be named after American heroes, and I think these qualify as well as anyone. No argument there. The cost of each was somewhere around 120 to 140 million dollars, which is in today's dollars the cost of one missile that they carry in today's boats, and there are 24 in each boat times change. The specifications, 382 feet long, 33 foot diameter hull. That's uh, made of uh, uh, high tensile HY-80 steel, powered by an S5W nuclear plant, two 1928 vintage low pressure turbines, one propeller, 25 knots submerged and 20 knots surfaced, plus Notice the plus over on the right side. That's because it's really substantially more than that, but this is the official version. 700-foot 
test depth plus I've been plus <laughs> 6,000 tons surfaced, 6,800 tons submerged. What's the difference? 800 tons of water to make it sink. That's the way submarines surface and sink. You take on water, you blow out water, it floats, it sinks. 16 Polaris A-1 missiles and 12 torpedoes. Uh, all forward, by the way, in six torpedo tubes. The missiles that they carried uh, initially were the A-1 and then shortly after that the A-2 missile. It was a converted missile that had been developed by the Navy. You remember the Navy, the Air Force, and the Army all had missile systems in those years. These were ballistic missiles, like a shot from a gun. Once it's out of the barrel, it goes where gravity and its shape and speed take it. It's fired, it's gone, it's not controllable, it's ballistic. So it had to be pointed through a point in space where it could come down within a reasonable distance of its target. The earliest missiles could come within a thousand yards of their target and they're much closer today. This is as opposed to, to guided missiles, which are, as they say, as the name says, they are uh, missiles that can be guided through their path. The range by the A3 missile, which was still around shortly after the time we're talking about, by the mid-1960s, uh, the A3 could reach nearly anywhere with its retaliatory strike force. Even the A-1, which, which had a shorter range, was just half, really one-third of the range of the missiles six years later, uh, could reach a distance of from New York to Chicago, for example. From the Baltic to Moscow, for example. In modern terms, from Cyprus or the Gulf of Oman to Tehran and across two-thirds of China, which is almost exactly the same size as the United States in square miles. A lot of people don't appreciate that fact, but we are almost identical in physical size, China and the U.S. That gives some appreciation of those distances, and although this is not a globe, so the distances are distorted, you know this. Even in this projection, you will appreciate that in the map that you see, the distances were almost anywhere that, that could be reached, or at least threatened, at least by the mid-1960s. In the years from then until now, a new class of missile submarines has had a better weapon to use with each new class of submarines. Today's best, the Trident D-5 on the right, broke the record of 76 consecutive successful test firings, the previous record, and they broke that record in 1995. Today, that record stands just under 150 successful test firings. The D-5 will be the missile of choice, and you see the difference in size between the original missiles. Really look at the A3, that's the one that we used for a long time. The third from the left compared to the one on the right. The relative size was 28 feet long versus 45 feet long and uh, 54 inches in diameter, four and a half feet versus 83. So that, that gives some idea of, of what these missiles uh, look like in size. Let me take you back to Christmas Eve 1958, the day we arrived at Mare Island in Vallejo. As a graduate mechanical engineer, I was given the, the plum assignment of being one of the officers in charge of the building of the SSBN 600, the Theodore Roosevelt, and I stayed in that job until February of 61 when it was deployed to sea. Over that time, my responsibilities were for three of the eight compartments in the submarine. If we may look at this, I had the torpedo room, the sail area, and the control room just below that, and the auxiliary machinery space between the nuclear compartment and the engine room. Um, 
when I say responsibility for that, I, I nominally had about 500 shipyard workers per day. I knew all the ship uh, yard workers by name by then in most cases. My name was on my hard hat, so they knew who I was. And, and it was a great training ground. I, I, I can't tell you what a, what a great period in my life that was. For six months of that period of time, I supervised the graveyard shift, that is from uh, 2200 to 0600, 10 o'clock at night to six in the morning, eight hours, um, for weld testing of putting together these 19 stacked tuna can sections and welding them together with 43 weld passes around a 33-foot diameter hull. That's a lot of welding rod. And every one of those welds were tested four ways. Magnetic particle or magnaflux testing, ultrasonic testing for inclusions below the surface that you couldn't see otherwise, x-ray testing, and, and the fourth one, <laughs> which is uh, dye penetrant testing. How could I forget? It's only been 55 years. <laughs> uh, it it uh, was a serious time in my life. I was we we had uh, three kids by the name by the time we left Mare Island, a fourth born in Japan. Um, in those lonely hours at two, three, four in the morning, when the uh, only ones on board were the X-ray crew and Lieutenant Junior Grade Jones in those years. I had a lot of time to ask myself, what the heck am I building? What am I doing here? And I decided then and now that it was worth it. How do you build a missile launching nuclear submarine? It's a very good question. The first thing you do is to go to the top engineering schools in the country and hire some of the best engineers you can find. These are not two of them. That's uh, Warren Getz and I. I. I relieved him on station in, in uh, Japan in 62. And he and I are still good friends. He lives in San Diego and we get vacation together. Another Big Ten guy. We're going to look at how nuclear submarines are made, or at least were in those in those years. Um, and this is not technical. At least I'll I'll try to make it not technical. The first thing you're seeing is is not a submarine section. The submarine section is that smaller diameter stuck into the slot of the bigger section. The smaller section is 33 feet in diameter. You can imagine that bigger section is about 75 feet in diameter, and it rotated on rails and could rotate the section inside so that the welding being done on that section to put the interior stiffeners and bulkheads in were always in the downhand position of the welding rod. Nothing overhead, nothing all the welding was exactly the same, and then it was tested. I see Dave Nauer, my fellow Purdue engineer over there, giving it this, you know, <laughs> downhand welding, very important. When the sections were made, they were stacked uh, side by side on the building ways. Now this slide needs to be understood in several ways that aren't immediately apparent. At the far end, or the top, of this slide is the Napa River. That's where the submarine will be launched. There is no flooding of the launch ways because there's a coffer dam across there to keep the river out. The launch ways are uh, very traditional. They're, they're heavy grease platforms, two, two rails as it were, uh, grease covered with with uh, uh, hardwood boards, and eventually, when the trigger is released, the greatest transfer of weight known to humankind will be transferred from here to there. The launching of a ship. So it's very important, and the forces at work are colossal. 
on the, the very slight angle of the building ways. On the right-hand side of the slide is another submarine. There's a hut built over the uh, control spaces where the sail will go, and that's the USS Halibut, or SSGN uh, 5, I've forgotten the hull number, but, but that was a, a ballistic missile launching submarine. Had a hangar on the bow where a, a ballistic missile could be uh, withdrawn to the surf. It, it was surface launched. This was not subsea, and then pointed skyward and fired. It was a guided missile that could be fired from sea, and it had uh, nuclear warhead capability. We'll talk more about that in a moment. So now we're we're back to the the uh, keel laying. When the first hull section is put in place, it's called the keel laying from the old traditional terms. It was first laid down in May of 58 as the USS Scamp 588, the Sculpin, Scamp, and the Scorpion class. Uh, um, when Ike decided we would have nuclear boats, they took two or maybe three of the existing hulls that were on the building ways, stretched them 116 feet apart, and put in 16 missile tube section and the same power plant. And so that's how we saved an awful lot of time. Here's a later photo. Now the submarine on the left is the Theodore Roosevelt, late in its progress on the building ways, long before its commissioning, but before it was launched. The one on the right is the TR. The one on the left is the halibut, and it's about to be launched. Now, there's a lot of water in the dock, in, in, in the building ways, because they've taken the coffer dam out, you see. And, and that sits down in a, a, an increasingly sloped pit, which confines that water. On the lower left of the picture, there is a platform. And right there is a naval officer in a hard hat with a movie camera up to his eye. When that submarine was launched, the bulk of the submarine went down into the water. The people on the platform, including myself with the camera, suddenly had a surge of water about waist high. And the movies go from here to here, as I'm knocked backward by the wave, and I know why, but not everybody would 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 get it. It was a, a happy day for us to go from being land-based to being water-based. There is more that goes into a submarine than you would ever begin to realize. There are miles and miles of both tubing, copper tubing, and and monel metal, and and high tensile steel tubing of various kinds, and uh, electrical cabling. Then, of course, there's the heavy machinery, the, t the turbines, the loading of the nuclear power plant. All of that has to be inserted in the proper sequence in the proper place. In order to do that, full-scale mock-ups were created on shore inside the uh, inside machinist shop. In the center section there, the narrowed down section, it has a kind of a bridge. That's a strong back, and that could be lifted off. There's a hatch cut out there that could be lifted off, and that actually was duplicated on board ship. Because once the submarine was integral and stress relieved, all, all those had to be strip heated and stress relieved so that there were no stresses left in the hull, then they cut, we cut a hatch in the hull, lifted that plate off and put the nuclear vessel down in that narrowed section. It was surrounded by lead cladding and, and external tankage and, and that sort of thing. And then another hull was put around it to be the same diameter and, and fared in with the rest of the hull. Here's a shot of inside machine shop. It was three blocks long. It was that giant building that you saw in the background when the tuna can sections were on the dock side. It was so fascinating that with all the work going on, it could take as long as 15 minutes to walk from one end to the other. 
They're rolling missile tubes here. This is where the sonar dome was attached to the missile tube. That big jaw under there shows where the sonar dome would go. So that section is being lowered into place as one of the very last things. The day of launch finally arrived, October 3rd, 1959. Remember, it wasn't put to sea till February of 61. So October 59 plus 14 months in the water for the final fitting out, all the testing and, and sea trials. But I love that picture for a lot of reasons because it brings back so many memories and it's such a proud picture of a, of a great sunny day. The uh, stairway makes me smile because we were really worried about how we were going to get the ship's sponsor up that stairway. More about that in a minute. We did, we did get her up there despite the fact, well, we'll, we'll get to that. The uh, submarine crew and all of us who worked on her were given, very proud to wear uh, the insignia of the big stick, that TR, <laughs> the biggest stick TR could possibly imagine, I think, the Theodore Roosevelt SSPN 600. The submarine is actually in the launch sequence right now. It is sliding down the ways as you see this picture. This is quite a dramatic time. Little by little, the wood blocks that are keeping the submarine from sliding down the ways are removed. There is a launch trigger which shows the detection of any motion of the submarine, which if it starts to go, they pass the word and you get out of the way because she's going to go. There's nothing can be done. But ultimately, there is a nine foot long launch trigger that can be thrown over and releases the final trigger and it's launched. And it worked perfectly. It's been done that, well, I'm not sure it's still being done. What do I know? The, in those years, it was still being done that way and it was very effective. The sponsor is someone you may recognize, maybe not, Alice Roosevelt Longworth. And I thought at the time, this is a wonderful day. I, I happen to have known a little something about her, and later on we've learned a lot more about her. She was born in 1884, and boy, she was old. In fact, she was one year younger than I am right now. <laughs> but boy, was she really old. <laughs> she had a reputation, uh, self-proclaimed, as a great hostess in Washington, D.C., but she was, in fact, uh, uh, not, not only a self-declared power broker, because she knew a lot of people, but she was a real gadfly. She had, as a young, not so young girl, had gone to the Far East with uh, President William Howard Taft. Some of you may know about this. It's a great historical uh, episode and had caused some mischief, even though she was a young hostess in those days. Uh, 1909, she would have been about 25 years old in those years and, and an elegant young lady and TR's daughter. So, and, and, but here we are in 1959 and and uh, I, I, I like this favorite saying, my favorite saying, one of her sayings, the secret of eternal youth, uh, uh, eternal youth merely requires arrested development. <laughs> <laughs> and true to her nature as a gadfly, she took that champagne bottle, drew it back, the submarine started to go, and she missed. <laughs> she missed. Uh, on the bow of the submarine, there's a guy right here and a line tending down. That's just for that purpose, in case the launch does not take place as planned. He quickly pulled the bottle up and smashed it on the hull before the hull was wet in the water. 
it's very bad luck if you don't christen a ship before she hits the water. And here she is standing with the shattered champagne bottle thanks to his quick action. <laughs> Finally, on a chilly February day, befitting its somber mission, the TR was commissioned and set out, making eventually 43 cruises, 90 days each, or about 11 total years at sea, and not counting any time in port. She had a great career, and then she was uh, put out of the service. Fixed in my memory are several personal experiences that I'd like to tell you about. When we tested the missile tubes alongside the dock, it, it required not a real missile, but a shoe or sabot, S-A-B-O-T in French, sabot, as in saboteur, a foot pad, right, sabot. And, and the submarine was laying in the water right alongside the dock. We turned her 15 degrees to port by ballast tanks, easy to do. <laughs> Put that sabot, a four foot tall uh, missile diameter shoe, into the bottom uh, of the tube, and we filled it with fresh water, so, so it wouldn't be corrosive, actually distilled water. And then, when the launch signal was given, blew it 150 feet in the air. I have movies. I, uh, I, I didn't know how to get them into the on-screen presentation, but it's uh, interesting to see that uh, Sabo going 150 feet in the air to the cheers of the crowd uh, after the missile doors had been opened and, poof, and then closed. Quite a sight. Secondly, was also alongside the dock. Now, we had moved from our office building alongside the building ways, directly across alongside the building ways. We had moved to a living barge. The, the dock was here, the submarine was here, and we had what had been a movable living barge that the crew of a ship under repair would move with it wherever it was, alongside the wall, near the dry dock, wherever. On this particular day, we were going to test torpedo tubes. And the way you test torpedo tubes is to load a dummy, plaster-headed <coughs> torpedo of the same weight and description, but completely a dummy. You ballast down the stern of the submarine slightly, mm -hmm and put the bow up as high as she'll go and put a submarine net ahead of the submarine and then you fire it into the net. It porpoised. It went right over the net and buried itself in the bulkhead of our office barge. That's one I remember pretty well. <laughs> there, there were some conversations held <laughs> after that. On one of the, on one of the uh, uh, trial runs, we were out at sea on a Sunday morning. Actually, it had been overnight. And on Sunday morning, there was a Catholic chaplain on board and he had a, um, a, a portable altar, which was uh, a three-section board that could swing out like this. And he laid one end on each torpedo rack in the torpedo room. <laughs> and I have often thought of the irony of this weapon of mass destruction with a Catholic mass being said, as an altar in the torpedo room. <laughs> the pressures on board of, of the, uh, the air and the hydraulics were massive. We used 4,500 PSI hydraulic system. That is the pressure at about 10,000 feet of depth in the sea, so that's quite dramatic. The last words 
when commissioning a ship, bless this ship and all who sail in her. All. Who were all these people who sailed in her? I'm not exactly sure how the enlisted men were were uh, individually picked, but they were very well qualified, very highly tested, very highly motivated, had all been through nuclear power school and were trained up to the eyeballs. But I do know the three-word answer to how the officers were picked. Hyman George Rickover. There's no question that the first number of crews uh, and, and, and many of the later crews for gee, a couple decades from the beginning were all Rickover's people. He was uh, called very correctly the father of the nuclear navy. He was persistent, very intelligent, very complex. In, in reading about him in Rickover, which is in the public library. Controversy and Genius, a biography. It's very readable, lots of good pictures and a real window into the nature of, the, of that complex man. Uh, we, we find somebody who was alone but never lonely and he was 150% devoted to his chosen mission he was very demanding of other peoples and he was uncaring of their inconveniences like family and time off, and hour of the night, uh, whatever. In my experience, no one who ever met him came away without a story to tell and I <laughs> certainly have my own. Uh, I, I, will, I will pause to mention that Dan Crane, who lives in PVE, former executive uh, uh, vice president of sales for for um, uh, a, a Japanese printer manufacturing company, it starts with E. Why can't I think of it? Epson, of course, Epson, uh, and I had coffee at Starbucks, and he was a boomer sailor. He was an officer on board of the uh, another submarine built at Mare Island later on and he had his own Rickover story to tell about his recruiting having to being put in Rickover's coat closet for three hours and made to sing Navy songs I mean he was obtuse stories about people um, never having one question asked of them just get out of here. That was the interview. In some cases, uh, well, in Dan Crane's case, that's what happened to him. Rickover said, get out of here. He got to the door. Wait a minute. You're from the South. Yes, sir. Do you eat how many grits? Yes, sir. Get out of here. <laughs> and he was selected. I, I, I can't explain it. I, I wouldn't attempt. When he would come aboard Mare Island, aboard the station, uh, in the early overnight hours, like 0200, 0300, in civilian clothes, in a rental car, he would dare the poor Marine guarding the gate to not recognize and salute him. Um, but we always were tipped off and warned them. He uh, uh, personally um, interviewed uh, all of them with, with uh, innocuous or whatever the opposite of innocuous questions or very pointed questions. But his perceptions were uncanny. He chose the best. I knew a lot of the early officers in ship's crew and I've never, genuinely, I've never met a finer bunch of people. Just remarkable. He was in the top 15% of his academy class. 
One night in 1959, I had the administrative watch duty in the, in the shipyard uh, headquarters building. Uh, and with nothing to do, I saw an old file cabinet with index cards in it, and I started looking for well-known naval officers, and I found Ensign H.G. Rickover, 1921, just out of the academy, 123 and a half Georgia Street, Vallejo. When I was there, 123 and a half Georgia Street was one of the biggest red light houses in <laughs> Vallejo. I have no idea what it was in 1921. Perhaps his people skills just exceeded normal perception. Such was his genius. On the first sea trial of the 600, he was aboard in borrowed chief's uniforms without collar devices, this little silver-haired man. He couldn't have been more than 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, something like that. Demean a giant, as, as we say. <laughs> and and uh, we, were, we were waiting for crash dive and, and resurface tests. Now, in this picture, forward in the submarine is facing toward the right-hand side of the picture. And athwart ships, or toward the hull, toward the side of the submarine, is the direction the crewman, the, the chief sitting at the, at the boards, at the Christmas tree, as it's called, is, uh, is located to the left. The wheels are for the sail and the rudder planes. That is the two large hand wheels. When the uh, signal to dive was given, dive, dive, the wheelman spun the bull wheel, which is what it's called. The big one is called the bull wheel, and that's the one that sends you down quickly, with such strength alacrity and purpose that the admiral immediately dubbed him Bull Moose after Teddy Roosevelt and he carried that name I'm told the rest of his career. He was very popular with the enlisted men. I think because they gave he gave the officers such a hard time why, would, <laughs> why wouldn't he be? At the end of the sea trial we were under the Golden Gate Bridge it was at sunset and I was up in the sail area, no duties at that point. Uh, fading light coming under the Golden Gate, as I, as I say, uh, from sea trials out past the Farallon Islands. When the captain called, clear the bridge, I was nearest the hatch, so as I'd done many times, 25 inch diameter hatch, I put one foot on the outside of each of the rails, grabbed and slid down. <laughs> Done it a lot. You know, I was, what, 26 years old. Easy to do. I didn't even get new knees out of it, you know. At, uh, as, as I did so, a small man who had come aboard in civilian clothes was just then squeezing Thor chips past the ladder. As I descended rapidly, three things happened in rapid order. One heel fell hard on each shoulder of Hyman George Rickover, crumpling him to the deck. Two, the order rigged for red was passed so that the white lights went out and the red lights came on to preserve your night vision, but instantaneously you're blind just until you accustom. Very fortunately. The third thing that happened was that Lieutenant J.G. Jones rapidly vanished down two decks and did a 45 minute inspection of the backside of the 10 foot diameter gyro stabilizer. <laughs> Personal stories. There he is, uh, coming aboard. Ah. Where are we today? This is not a Polaris missile submarine. This is a con conventional nuclear submarine, an attack submarine, the Nebraska, uh, as it would have been. It's hard to get pictures of, of really modern submarines, but here's one from a submarine that was launched in 
1993. Submarine shown has eight torpedo tubes that launch not only submarines, but Tomahawk airborne cruise missiles from under the sea launched from, from the depths. Other subs can carry landing party, la landing party craft in a separate submersible submarine carried on deck and can act as the salvation to other sunken subs. Some are said to cut and intercept undersea communications cables, and we know that's been done. That's, that's how we've intercepted some of the information that we have. I don't know how many of you knew that. You know, I hope that's news. I hope that makes you smile. There are always 14 boomers at sea. They're all around the world. They're armed with 24 Trident D5 missiles per submarine, each with eight MIRV warheads, multiple independently targeted reentry vehicle warheads. Then you can add four more, where 23 of the 24 missile tubes have been converted to carry seven Tomahawk cruise missiles per tube, times 23, that's 161 missiles. The 24th tube is where all the controls go for the 23 <laughs> missiles. The UK has four more boomers at sea, and we work together. I suppose it's not happy news that France, Russia, China, and India also have fleet ballistic missile submarines like these. Our commitment to this deterrent has, has lasted us well over 50 years. The Federation of American Scientists said that George Washington can be considered the submarine that has most influenced the world in the 20th century. Finally, I give gratitude to all those who have served in harm's way for the ideals of our precious republic. God bless America. Thank you for watching Peninsula Senior Lecture Series. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.